But Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 20, read this way in the New Living Translation. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word of God this morning or this afternoon now. God, I pray that you use this servant, God, to be obedient to your word, to speak what you need me to speak, God. Lord, even if you have to adjust this message in the middle of the sermon, God, I'm fine with that. I'm your servant. I'm obedient to you. So, Father, have your way in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. First point, thank you, Brother AJ. We're going to talk about equipping the body, but therefore there's a statement right here that that Jesus is telling us to do. He says, I have been given all authority in heaven and in earth. Now, therefore, go. And so our first thought today is simply, therefore, go. Go. We've made these commandments over our lives, over our, over our years, whether it be to our children. Maybe we've been told to go and do a specific thing. As a parent, many of you guys understand this. As a manager or a CEO or a president, or you run your own company of some sort, we are given a specific amount of authority to operate under. We all understand. Some of us, we don't always see eye to eye <clears throat> with those who do have authority over us. And so we're like, man, I don't know why we're doing this. I don't know why. And how, you don't have to raise your hand in here, but if you've ever worked for somebody and they've came up with something and you're like, this is idiotic. Why are we doing this? This is stupid. You know, you may not have ever said that. Well, maybe you did say that and that's how you got fired or something. You got let go for, uh, for some other stuff. Um, subordination, you know, because listen, I told you to do something. You didn't do it. And so we understand this as a parent though. And we can relate this as a parent. Now, I was talking with my brother in the back this week about, he was talking about some things uh, that he's going through with his, his parenting and some, ish, some things that is rising up right now. And, and I remember to go back and think about when my babies were growing up. And one thing that I begin to understand is that I had to let my children know who has the authority in this house. It is not you, it is not your little sister, Isaiah or brother Trinity it is your mom and your dad and so therefore I had to set the precedent I am the one whom has the authority and you must do what I tell you to do and here was the tough part about raising children is you have to be consistent in that world you can't waver you can't say well here's what I speak and this is what should happen but I might let you slide here and uh, you're going to get yourself into some problems. And I know every parent in this room, if you begin to pull back the reins, you would understand, yeah, yeah, you can't, you can't do it that way. You have to show consistency. But I like this. As a parent, we are given authority over our children to raise them. As a manager, you are or a, a director of your department. Maybe you're a department head. You are given some authority from somebody above you to say, do this job, make this job happen. And as a manager, we have to go to our employees and try to say, let me help you. Let me educate you. Let me give you the tools. And so you can develop the principles to make this job be an effective job and so these are things that we are given and we are given authority in that situation Jesus said I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth and then what he does he barks out an order go now go he says listen let me help you out again let me tell you who I am I'm Jesus. I have been given all power under the sun on this earth and in heaven. Now I'm telling you to go and do what I've called you to do. He barks out the order pretty clear. Has the church, this is the question today, has the church been portraying our allegiance to his call to go or have we been rebellious? We've got to ask that, that question to ourselves. I made the statement that I want to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. 
But if I only talk about it on Sunday morning or Sunday afternoons or Wednesday evenings and you do not see me doing what God has called us to do on Monday through Saturday, then we got a problem there because some of us may be operating in rebellion. And so I think about from the parenting side, when God tells us to do something or a parent tells your child to do something, the expectation is what? Do it, right? You don't give it, you don't give it an open forum to say, let's, let's talk about this. Let's debate this. It's an open and shut and closed book right here. When we tell our child to do something, now do it. Look at Ephesians chapter four. Verses 11 and 13 in the New Living Translation, it says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. Listen to what he says. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and the knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Which brings my second point. Being equipped to measure up to the standard of Christ. And Paul reads, or reads or tells this to the church of Ephesus here, and he says, listen, that, that we may gain or that we may reach until we reach the maturity in the Lord, that we may measure up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So that means we have a season of having to grow. There's a season of having to mature in this thing we call the walk with Christ. We don't just all of a sudden wake up and say, I say the sinner's prayer. And now let me go and do exploits and wonders. It's a process. We have to develop maturity over time. We have to develop how to apply the word of God to our heart. Then we have to develop some areas in our life. Anybody that has a baby, I look over here and I see a little Leia sitting in the front row. She's three, right? She's three for a couple more months. But I cannot expect a Leia to go and do the dishes, nor could I expect her to go and make us a, a, a three-course meal. Say, make me a, give me my salad ready, Alea, and then I want you to make me some pork chops later and a baked potato, but you gotta cook the baked potato where it's nice and fluffy. I couldn't expect her to do that because she's not there yet. She's not developed a mature level to understand how to do that. What could Alea probably make me? Kenna, what do you think? <clears throat> what could, what could Alea make me right now? She can bring me a bag of chips. That's, this is good. She could probably bring me maybe a pop or a can of drink of some sort, a bottle of water. And that's the maturity level that she's capable of giving us. And so Paul is telling us to be equipped to measure up to the standard of Christ, which is where we get this thought process of maturity. Well, let's look at maturity. Maturity is being mature in Christ, is being conformed to his image, and therefore it is walking as he walked. This is a level of maturity. Once you become mature in the things of God, you can begin to do the very things that we saw Christ, our Savior, begin to operate it. Not, not that you know, there are certain things we read in the scriptures. Well, you, does that mean I'm supposed to be walking on water all the time? Does that mean I'm supposed to be? No, you gotta understand this. Jesus walked with power and authority on this earth. And he says, you now are joint heirs with me, Christ Jesus. And so therefore, as we understand this concept that what is my father's, I can also embrace for myself. It is not just, he's not going to withhold anything from me. This is something that we'll talk about this another day and another time. And, but I'm telling you, God would withhold nothing from you. Years I would remember people would say, I don't know why God's not giving me the Holy Ghost. And I begin to try to remind myself and read the Bible and think to myself, well, the word of God says when you receive Jesus Christ, you receive the fullness of God and now his spirit indwells in you. Somewhere we just got it, made it like you had to earn the Holy Ghost somehow outside of Jesus Christ. That's, a, that's not even in my notes. I told you I shouldn't have prayed that way. 
But I promise you, listen to me today. We want to be in the fullness of God. And if we are walking in his fullness, God said he would withhold nothing from his children. If my child was hungry and he asked for bread, I would not give him a stone. Now we got to understand God is a good God. He loves you. He loves you so much that he knows when you are hurting. You can be in your lowest of lows and feel like all hell is broke loose in your life. You need to rest assured that God is all knowing and he knows what you're going through. He knows the battles that you're facing. He knows the struggles that you're dealing with. But God would not withhold his blessing from anyone. So we got to think about this maturity side. So how to be develop maturity is we have to go through a process. I began to think when Isaiah was born now 23 years ago, uh, almost 24 years ago, we didn't immediately put Isaiah and say, start walking, son. Start eating steak. Nor would we imagine just to do that to Owen tomorrow. Owen is too little. What? That's what Chase tries to do. He's trying to push the development. Even though there's no teeth yet. There's no teeth in his mouth. He's like, give that child some beef. But listen, that's silly to think about. It's a process, right? So you start with baby food, or maybe you start off breastfeeding, then you have formula, and then you develop baby food over time. And then once the teeth start coming and you start developing solid food, and then as solid food goes on, now you can just go and pick what you like and desire to want to eat. This is, this is, kinda, this is called a, 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 a form of maturity over time. Look at Colossians 2 and 6, or chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Kenna read this earlier, and it reads this way. And now, just as you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your, this is a whole mouthful right here in verse 7. Let your roots grow down into him, and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Let me get this in your spirit. Verse seven there, right there. Let your roots grow deep or grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Listen, this is the structure that we have to develop. There's no other structure. You cannot build your hope upon Bridgeway Christian Center. You cannot build your hope on whatever denomination that you may have been a part of or under. You may not build your hope and your foundation upon your favorite preacher that's out there in this world. Listen, our hope is only built upon Jesus Christ. It should be. Let me say it that way. It should be. So let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. And what does he say? Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. So if we're talking about maturity, there has to be another set of, there has to be another form here. And this is where we get immaturity. Now immaturity is lacking complete growth, differentiation or development. I made this comment before in, in past services. If all that we fed a lay of a three-year-old little girl for the next 20 years was Doritos and Mountain Dew. We talked about that, I think, on a Wednesday. Uh, Le uh, uh, Alicia began to say some things would start falling apart in the body. What did we talk about? What did you say if that's all she would take? What were some of the things that would fall apart? kidneys, her muscle development would not exist. Her brain development would begin to probably diminish, uh, putting nothing but sugar and garbage in her system. So here's the thing that we do is we lack complete growth or di differentiation or development. Look what Paul says in Hebrews chapter five, verse 12. You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. But here's what he says. I love this. Instead, you need someone to teach you, again, the basic things about God's words. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. We just had that reference in here. But Paul is making this conversation to the believers of this time, the supposedly mature Christians at this time. And he says, I, I, you should be teaching other people by now. Why is it that you're always coming on Sundays and Wednesdays starving 
to death. Why is it that you are immature in your walk with Christ for so long? And I love this particular passage because we now have been given the word of God that we can open daily, nightly, weekly, anytime we want. This word has not been withheld from his believers. So we can tap into the word of God anytime we want, but yet... So many times I've heard through counseling sessions or I've heard people come into the church and say, oh God, I need the word. I would, I would truly love to volunteer in the children's department, but God, I need the word today. I am struggling and my spirit is hungry. And I, I hear two ways of seeing that. I hear two ways of, of that being passed forward. Number one, I see two levels of maturity. Immaturity and la or maturity and immaturity. These are the two types of people that we are faced with. Two types of people we are faced with are immature and mature Christians. We understand that there are levels to this thing. Levels of faith, levels of relationship, levels of education. Now listen, we are not all on the same level playing field, but we are to strive to increase our knowledge in the word and increase our lack of faith to the levels that Christ had demonstrated for us. That is, that is our ultimate duty. My ultimate duty is not to wait to come in on Sunday and now I have, well, I'd have to say I'd have to hear myself, but back in the day just to wait for the pastor to speak a word for me. Number one, it should be confirmation. It should be building my spirit man up. But number one, Monday through Saturday, I should be seeking his face, seeking his word, trusting and in, in ob abiding in his word. Listen, we are faced with two types of people. You're either immature or you're mature. You've got to figure out who am I in this demograph? Who am I? Look what Jesus says in Matthew 17 and 17. Said so Jesus said, you faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. We understand that this, this was leading up to the particular passage that there was a, there was a young boy who had seizures and was, it was having issues in his physical body and they brought him to the disciples and the disciples went to pray and lay hands upon on, on this child and they said they couldn't do anything for my son. And Jesus then makes this statement to his disciples, you faithless and corrupt people. You would think he was talking to the sinners out in the world but he was talking to his disciples, his followers, people he was pouring into. He was saying, you faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring this boy over to me. And we know the scripture, Jesus healed the child and commanded that demon to come out of that child. Why was Jesus so upset with his disciples is the first question. Like, why was he so harsh on him? Why would he say that you're faithless and corrupt people? Here's the thing, Jesus had been pouring into them truth and power, and when the boy was brought to his disciples, they couldn't do anything for this child, but Jesus immediately heals him and sets him free from that demon. We have to understand, Christ was given instruction Instruction was given to them prior, up leading to this point. He was telling them who they were and what they were capable of doing and the power that he now possessed, and yet they still did not comprehend. We can find in the scripture in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, just prior to the verse of chapter 17, here's what he tells Peter. Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I, here's a, he, listen to what he says here. He says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And look what Jesus tells his disciples. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. What we see here is Jesus was trying to equip the disciples to be the church, but they were not even receiving it. Sounds eerily like what we are seeing today in the modern church. We want to be the hands and feet, but we're not portraying the hands and the feet. We want to see his signs, miracles, and wonders to follow those that believe. But yet the question is, are we truly believing 
that Jesus Christ is capable of doing the miraculous, healing those who are broken, healing or restoring those who need restoration. Jesus was trying to equip the disciples to be the church. And that's what the whole key is here. I taught on Wednesday that we, we have just become an organized social club, I'm talking about the church in general. The church in general has become an organized social club in so many settings. But we are called to be the ecclesia. That's just a Greek word for the church. A body that is united in mission, purpose-driven for one cause. That, that, and that is to bring knowledge to as many people as we can that there is only one way. And that way is only through Jesus Christ. You know, I would love to sit here and say, go out, we got to go and invite our people to come to church. All we've got to do is just share that there's only one way to heaven. And that is through our son, our, our savior, Jesus Christ. There's only one way to heaven, not multiple ways. I'm sorry, Oprah, you're wrong. There's not multiple ways to our heavenly father. The only way to the father is through Jesus Christ. Which brings me to the third point. When we are united, we're leading up to equip the saints for one purpose, to unite the body of Christ, to unite us for one purpose. Once we have equipped ourselves with the knowledge of God and begin to understand our purpose, look what Paul tells the church of Ephesus in Ephesians chapter four, verse 14 and 16. It reads, then, here's what he says, then we will no longer be immature like children. Listen, once we've accepted our purpose, here is what's going to happen. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body, here it is, so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That is the scripture today. Understand, here is who we've been called to be. Why is it that we're operating in levels that we should have been grown out by now? Why is it that we're still stuck in kindergarten for 20 years? Now we think about that, we laugh about it. If your kid's still in kindergarten and they're 20, we got a problem. But here's what we see in the churches. It's okay to look at 20-year-old Christians that still have a kindergarten education or a kindergarten maturity level. And you're wondering to yourself, what has happened? What, what has been missed? Where, and then, so what we're trying to do at Bridgeway is that's why it's important for discipleship. This is why Jesus said, therefore go. Here, listen, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Now, therefore go and make disciples. This is the purpose. We're trying to educate, instruct, help each other. When you see that young person, and I'm not talking just in physical age, when you see that young Christian who may be 45 years old but just gave their heart to Jesus, we assume they'll figure it out on their own. Back in the day, it was all about just convert them, convert them to salvation, but it was nothing to do with discipling any, back then. That's, that has to change in the church. It's one thing we want to convert. We want to bring in the sinners that they come to know a savior in Jesus Christ, but it doesn't stop there because if it stops there, then we have 20 year old kindergartners in our church. We don't need that. And I don't want God to look at this church and say, you just exist to exist. You know, I told you all, well, some of you, you th those that came on Wednesday, God spoke so clear to my spirit on this particular area. And he goes, what I see in the church today, I have nothing to do with it. He goes, because it's become organized production and entertainment. And I want to be the focal point of the church. And then he begins to, he begins to speak this over me. Now you go and develop the body of Christ. You now go and equip the body, the, the saints of Jesus Christ. Go and equip them. How do we equip them? We got to develop them. 
We got to begin to pour into them as much as we can. Push them to their limits. There's some things about Isaiah when he was growing up as a, as a sports player. I remember as clear as day, Jesus, we was at the YMCA and I was trying to work on his right hand. He's a left-handed kid, those that don't know. He shoots left-handed, does everything left-handed, throws, except he writes and eats right-handed, which is interesting. But he does everything left-handed. And I remember going, I said, Isaiah, if you want to go to the next level of sports, you better figure out how to use that right hand. And so he was probably maybe 10 years old at the time. It was right when we first moved here into Muncie. And we went to the Muncie downtown Y, and there was a bunch of kids in there, and he just wanted to show up his left hand. Like, yeah, I can do my left hand. You know, and do all that stuff. I was like, Isaiah, but you're one-dimensional. You have to develop this skill. You have to push yourself to do something that's not natural for you to do. And we sat in the Y. I mean, I'll never forget this, Chase. We sat in the Y, and I said, do the count steps. One dribble, one, or no, I had to do it backwards because he was doing it because he was left-handed. You got to go right, left, up. Right, left, up. And we did that what seemed to be probably skipped for an hour. To the point that Isaiah began to go, I don't want to play anymore. And he was getting so mad because he couldn't do it. He goes, I, I can't get my timing right. And I said, continue to better that because you're going to make muscle memory right, left, right, left. And he did that for the next 20 minutes, Jerry. And he finally was like, huh. And all of a sudden he was like, what? And it started coming to him. Then all of a sudden, even in, in middle school, that next year, he was more confident going to his right because we worked on that weakness of his. I'm telling you that reason because I want us to understand where we are weak, he is strong. And we have to understand, I can't do this on my own. God, equip me. Build my spirit man up that I may be the man of God, the woman of God that you called me to be. I don't want to be an immature, weak Christian anymore, but I want to be a developed, mature, on fire man of God for you that I may build your kingdom. And I'm closing with this as the music's coming. When we become mature, and equipped on the things of God, we won't fall into the temptations of this world so easily. Now listen, we can be tempted. I'm not, don't hear me say, you'll never be tempted again. If you embrace this and become mature and equipped, you won't fall into temptation of this world so easily. Why? Because you'll have the word of God on the inside saying, no, 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 no. I need to turn from that wickedness or that evil or that negativity that's coming to me. We talked about this a few weeks back. We talked about you got those, we surround ourselves with people that are, we call it toxic love. If you remember that message, that we surround ourselves with a bunch of naysayers and negativity people that that's not healthy for us. We've got to identify that I got to be separate, uh, separated from this world. I have to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I can't do those things that I used to do. When we become mature and equipped on the things of God, we won't fall into the temptation of this world so easily. But we will. You know what will happen? We will be steadfast, unmovable, unstoppable force. Paul states in 1 Corinthians 15, he reads it this way in verse 57, but thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Come on, get that in your spirit today. This is, the, this is what I can bank on, McKenna. In chapter, 20, in chapter 15 and verse 57, I thank God because he gives me victory. He gives me victory over sin and death through Jesus Christ. That's the hope that I have. My hope is not built upon anything else, but I thank God for his saving grace. And then I can bank on that. Then I can do what Paul said. Then I can put my roots deep into that promise right there. Because you know what's going to happen? I'm going to fail God. I'm going to let him down. I'm going to probably, I'll probably, I'll discourage him because of some of the things that I'm not, I'm supposed to be doing, I won't be doing. 
but I'm preparing my mind for the things that God has in store for me just as you should be saying God develop me that I may be mature in the things of God I want to be more like you I want to look like you I want to talk like you I want to react I want to act like you God and I'm going to do whatever I got to do to make that happen if you will stand to your feet